pull up a chair and buckle up. It's the Original Strength Podcast. Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us this week. I am with a very special guest, Mr. Stephen Greenstein, who is the grandson of Joseph Greenstein, who you might know as the Mighty Adam. Stephen, thanks for being on the show with us. Thank you so much for having me. So you just made a documentary recently about the life of the Mighty Adam. Yeah. Which was awesome because, you know, you, you hear stories and stuff, but to actually see the story of the Mighty Adam from a very good source family, <laughs> um, that was really, it was really a neat, neat documentary. Well, thank you so much. It's a really great story to have in the family and then something I want people to know about because it is so inspirational. And so I, I've, I've, I'm in the fitness industry, so I have a lot of friends that are in the iron game, um, and I've heard stories about the Mighty Adam for uh, several years. Uh, and so, and then like in the documentary, he was called the godfather of the iron game. Yeah, yeah. But what I found interesting is that he might be the godfather of the superhero. Yeah, yeah, that's um, something we can't prove, but a lot of logic goes into that assumption. Um, you know, most of his performing life. He was in Brooklyn and New York City. Uh, he had a, a store in Midtown Manhattan back when a regular person could afford to rent a store. And, um, you know, the people who created Superman uh, were two Jewish comic book writers who were in that part of the country. And, you know, my grandfather's main thing was bending steel. That's what he did. And, you know, we can't prove that they took that and made it into Superman, but it certainly is a very likely possibility. He performed all over the area and was very well known. So it just so happens that my favorite superhero is <laughs> Superman. Yeah. So when I saw that, I was like, no way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a really cool thing. I mean, you know, no one bent steel back then. I mean, my grandfather didn't invent all the things, most of the, the things he did, he invented, but, uh, but bending steel and the way he did it with scrolling was not common and certainly not in that part of the world. So, you know, I got to believe that the writers, they, they knew about this and they saw him perform or at least anecdotally heard about it. So even if he wasn't though, the godfather of superheroes and I, I like looking at the documentary, I was like, oh, that's very plausible. Um, yeah. He actually had a true superhero origin story though. I mean, it's classic. Yeah, it's unbelievable, but it is, it is true. I mean, he was supposed to die as a child. Uh, he had tuberculosis as a young man. Um, his father had died from tuberculosis and it just scared him as soon as he got it. I think uh, the stat was eight in 10 people back then would die from it. So it was pretty much a death sentence and he just did not want to give up and he was so frail. Um, and the, the quick version of the story is um, there was a circus coming into town. He wanted to meet strong men and learn how to be strong and overcome ailments. And he snuck into the show, he got caught and some of the people that worked at the show were beating him up. I guess back that's when, that's what you did. Someone snuck, in, <laughs> snuck into a show. And um, the strong man with the name was Valanco, and he happened to come across them beating him up, stopped them, and then asked him why he was there and cleaned him up. And he said he wanted to meet him and, and learn how to become strong. And Valanco took him under his wing. So he, he trained him mind and body and spirit. And um, he, my grandfather ran away with him and traveled the world and uh, learned how to become what he became. So, and I don't know if you know, well, you probably do. Uh, do you, have you ever heard of Wolverine? Oh, of course, yeah. So like really his origin story reminds me so much of Wolverine and, and even his, his, like, cause the Mighty Adam was only five foot four inches tall. Yeah. yeah. And so to me, it's like, it is the, he's Wolverine also. So it was just very neat to see the parallels. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a, a story that if it, wasn't in my family, I wouldn't believe it, you know? And the cool thing about what he did was that he was able to pass it on to so many. It, it, it just proves that there's so much you can do with will and with mindset and with dedication. And he wasn't supposed to live past 19 and he lived to 84 and he probably would have lived longer if he didn't, you know, uh, he ended up getting bladder cancer, but that's a separate, separate thing. Um, and he just was the picture of health for all of his life. And to do what he was able to do with metal and with bending and biting and, and with his hair. I mean, with his hair, that makes no sense, but he just figured out how to do it. He just convinced himself he would do it. Oh yeah. After watching the documentary, I was, I was convinced that he was superhuman. Um, yeah. I, I, cause I don't know of anybody else that is still has done those things that he was doing. 
Yeah, one story that I didn't put in the documentary because it didn't really fit the narrative, but it's also true. And people, you know, can say it's not true, but there's news reports of it back from, I think it was in the 20s. He was actually shot in the head uh, with a 22 caliber. So it was a small gun, but he was shot at close range and the bullet just lodged into his forehead and didn't kill him. Um, so he had a dent in his head for the rest of his life, but somehow the bullet didn't kill him. And, you know, in our family, we don't think he had special superhuman powers, but it could have been a faulty bullet, but who knows? I mean, he was certainly emboldened by that and just believed he could do whatever he needed to do. It's fascinating. He yeah. even had, there's, you also had a story about, and I got to ask you about this, uh, where it was almost like a Captain America type story where he took on a group of Nazis with a ball bat. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the stories of him fighting were common. So I put a few in the movie, but that's one thing in my family that I just, uh, he had 10 children, five boys, five girls. Uh, so I had, and my father's 91. He's the last remaining child. And so we grew up um, with a lot of family, a lot of family around and all the boys performed. So the four that were left when I was growing up, I watched them do these things. So it wasn't just hyperbole. I saw that, you know, my uncle Mike would punch a brick in half, you know, my uncle Harry would bite things with his teeth. So, and my father too, but you know, I got to see all these things, but the fighting stories, he was really a crusader for the little guy, you know, and there was a lot of anti-Semitism back then. And uh, this particular story you mentioned was uh, he was going through a particularly uh, German part of town. There was a Bund meeting and they had a sign on the second floor of a building that said um, Bund meeting, no Jews or dogs allowed. And so my grandfather went to the nearest hardware store that he could find. He bought a ladder. He went home and got a bat and he went up to the second floor, smashed the window, took the sign down and then came back down the ladder and just waited for everyone to come outside. And I believe it was somewhere in the, the neighborhood of 16 guys. And my grandfather was also a martial artist. That was part of the skill set that he picked up when he traveled the world with Volanco. He went through Asia and India proper and um, picked up a lot of skills. So when they came down, he just beat them all up um, and got taken to court and they threw it out of court. They, when they understood what happened, they threw it out of court. But the stories of him beating people up are, are legendary in my family. And he was known for doing it. That's, that's amazing. Um, so you, you kind of alluded to this earlier, uh, and I'll just see what you say. What do you think his true super, if he had superpowers, what do you think his true superpower was? It's his mind. Without a doubt, it's his mind. It's the absolute belief that he was going to do the thing he set out to do. And that's really the trick. And that's what he wanted to, you know, people will say it's a trick. It's not a trick. That's the technique. It's almost a form of hypnosis that you put yourself into a state that you will do the thing that's in front of you. And my dad used to say to me that when he was performing, my father would perform as well, and he was about to do one of his feats, you could wave your hand in front of his face and he wouldn't even see you. He was somewhere else. And that's what he needed to do to get there. I mean, he was five foot four, 140, you know, eight pounds, something like that, and picking up record amounts of weight. And the one that always kills me is he bites nails in half consistently. Like, who That's does amazing, that? you know, and so the the sheer force of will to convince yourself that you're supposed to be able to do this. That was his real power. That's well, so I was thinking about that, too. I'm like, and because somehow, like, I mean, if you think teeth going against iron or, you know, a steel chain that the teeth, the weakest link would be the teeth, you would think. Yeah, but yeah. he was snapping metal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and by the end of his life, his teeth were ground down to little nubs. They weren't really there anymore. You know, he did that for years and years. And then people would sometimes try to trick him and they would dip or they would temper the nails in some type of, you know, whatever it would be, epoxy, and they would give it to him. And so sometimes he would chip his teeth. So he always had to make sure that he had the nails uh. checked. You know, it's funny. A lot of people hear this stuff and think it's fake and think, okay, it's some type of, you know, trick. And one of the reasons why people would think that is he used to, one of the feats he would perform. He had 22 different feats he would perform on the regular. Um, and he had a bit of PT Barnum in him. He loved the show. He wasn't just doing it to set records. He was doing it for entertainment as well and to sell his, his health goods. But one of the things he would do is he would take uh, sheet metal and cover a, I think it was a two inch piece of wood and then take a nail with his hand and he would just drive it right through. Um, but one time he put the nail backwards right through his hand. Oh, so yeah, not good. And you don't 
come out of this life without injuries. You know, his, his left eye was completely milky from having a chain whip around to hit him. So he had a lot of injuries, but the way he would secure that he had the nail the correct way ever since is he would put it in his mouth and he would make sure he had the backside of the nail and then he would load it into his hand. And you use, for a lot of these feats, you use some type of cloth or suede or something so that you don't just puncture your skin. And people would think, oh, he's slicking up the nail or he's doing something in his mouth that makes it more you know, easier to go through the wood and the metal. And that simply wasn't the case. So you also mentioned that, like, so it's, to me, he was ahead of his time. Um, he wasn't just about feats of strength. He, he was also into the health business, health, uh, like trying to, he was a, he was the guy trying to get other people to be healthy. Yeah, that was his life's mission. If there was a life's mission, that was it. Um, he was a sick kid and everything he did with strength, at least originally came from an effort to be healthy and not die. And he was a, you know, obviously a performer. He was a man, not without ego, but whenever he met somebody who was sick, he would help. He would, that was something he was known for doing. So he would take people into his house. He would go to them. He would make them special ointments and things. And he created this stuff on his own. He had no degree in medicine, um, but he just researched and incessantly researched to the point where he was able to figure things out and cure himself and, and really be passionate about curing others. That was sickness. It was, he was more of a, uh, of a wellness coach than he was a strength coach, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah, I saw uh, what was really neat is that you said in the documentary that he actually had a place where it was like a resort where people could come to be healthy, learn yeah. how to cook, learn how to, to move. Um, like it was all encompassing health. And I thought that was brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. You know, he had so many ideas that were too far ahead of their time. And he wasn't the best businessman in the world. That's for sure. He tried. Uh, but he had this this mountain resort that was supposed to be a health retreat. And, you know, the family all helped out and built it with him. And it didn't do well financially, but it certainly helped people. But, it, you know, today this is so common. And, you know, people go places, learn how to cook, learn how to eat, work out, you know, work with, with trainers to get healthy. And he just did it a bit too early, unfortunately. So what I really loved about the documentary was your stance on – how anybody could do what your grandfather did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, that is my stance and that was his stance too. I mean, the point was you control your mind. So you can do what you want to do. With the metal, the only thing I ever tried to do, my dad kept me away from this life because it's, you have a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of injuries, but in making the film, I wanted to know if I could bend a spike. So I talked to some of the people who do it today and I learned how to bend a spike and make no mistake, it hurts, it hurts. There's a point where it hits your skin and your skin says, stop. And so you have to convince yourself that you're going to do it. But that's the technique. You have to just convince yourself that what you're told by your body that means to say stop doesn't mean stop. Now, sometimes that can cause injury. But in general, we're capable of so much more than we think we are because we're told to stop by society or by our, you know, some type of pain reflex and you can go a lot farther. And that was his message that, you know, you don't have to accept what everyone else tells you to do. And the proof was in the pudding. I mean, there's people today that still do it. Uh, obviously, he passed it on to Slim Farman. Slim passed it on to Dennis Rogers. And then, you know, generations afterwards. And the fact that I've seen, I go to some, you know, uh, events and I'll, I'll see a 120-pound woman bending steel. That just proves the point. Yeah, I think I, I, I wrote a quote down. I think you, it was you have to say, I'm going to be special. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I just thought that was powerful. Well, my uncle Mike, uh, the sort of ending of the film, my uncle Mike was asked to be on America's Got Talent uh, when he was 93. And he passed away at 95. But at 93, he pulled a car with my mother, father, and his then girlfriend in <laughs> New York City with his teeth. And, you know, 93. And he's pulling a car with his teeth. And there's just no objective reason why that should be possible. And if that doesn't show you that it can be done, I don't know what does. I mean, I think I said that in the film as well. Like, how can a 93-year-old, you know, walk up to a car and move it with his hands, let alone his teeth, you know? And it's just what he knew how to do. And, and when you get into that mindset, it is possible. The thing about the, the car, everyone always looks for some type of scam. And there's no scam if the ground is level. Right. 
once the car is moving, it's not a big deal. But to get the car moving with that inertia, it is a struggle. And it's not just your teeth, it's your neck, it's your jaw, it's, it's everything. Uh, and that's the weakest part of you. This part of you is probably the weakest part of you. And for a 93 year old to be able to do it with, you know, the additional weight of three people in the car is insane. What was wonderful about that clip though, was the joy and the cheering of the crowd around him. Like that had to feel amazing. Yeah. I mean, my family's a bunch of performers. That's what they did their whole lives. Uh, I've been around these crowds and I always think it's a shame that so few people know this is a thing. Um, Make no mistake, the iron bending community is a very eccentric community. You have a very, uh, a bunch of interesting personalities in a good way, you know, that, that are doing it. But I wish it was a bit more mainstream because, I mean, who doesn't want to know that they can achieve a lot more than they believe they can achieve? That's the message of his whole life, that you can live when they tell you you're not supposed to live, that you can bend steel with your hands. I mean, who, who can do that? You can bite through steel. Um, his life was a life that I don't think is possible to replicate today just because of the times we live in. And, you know, when he achieved what he achieved, that's one of the things we talk about in the film as well. There were no gyms, there were no trainers. You know, a part of what he did when he was very young is he would take cement and he would put it into cans. You know, so you get a can of peaches, he would unload the peaches and put cement in there and make a barbell. The things he had to do to overcome were epic and people can do it today if they just set their mind to it. Do you think that your your grandfather had a, a destiny to do this? Oh man, I, I, I'm a believer in you make your own destiny. So I don't, I don't know. I know he had just a force of will that I don't know that people have today. Um, here's an interesting story. I ended up meeting someone who is a, a very wealthy man who asked me to sell him some memorabilia. And I won't say who he is out of protection, but he's quite wealthy. So he wanted to meet my father and we had lunch and um, we, we put the one of the barbells that he had uh, one of the horseshoes he had bent into a, a box and, you know, really made it nice. And we're having lunch. And on the way out of lunch, he said he's going to Turkey. And I said, why are you going to Turkey, business or pleasure? And he said, I'm going for business. And I said, you hire in Turkey? He said, yeah, I don't think people here work hard enough. And it was really telling. I think it was a mindset thing like, you know, you can get soft pretty easily. You have to really have the will to want to do anything. And that could be business, that could be science, that could be personal, that could be strength. And that's what I'm most impressed with my grandfather about, you know, that he was just, nothing was going to stop him at whatever he wanted to do. And, you know, he did fail at some things, but it wasn't for lack of trying. I think the one he failed at that was pretty epic was he tried to stop the QE2, the boat from taking off with his hair. Um, because he did stop a plane from taking off with this. Yes. It's just insane, right? They had, uh, they strapped his chest with ropes so that he wouldn't fall. And then they put chains in his hair with a comb and he just stopped it from taking off. And it's like, mm -hmm. you know, so he would just, and I'll, you know, if he had more time, he would have figured out the QE2 thing also. He would have figured it out. So um, yeah, Will was his biggest attribute. The reason I asked you about that, because his whole story, it's, even, even so he's told he's sick, he's not going to live, but he, he never became, he never became complacent and he never be accepted that, or he was never satisfied. It seemed yeah. to be. So he was always driven. So even after he learned everything he learned and he came over here without, he was working at a gas station, Yeah, but he still trained. He mm -hmm. still, and he was still experimenting, still trained. And the reason I asked you about his destiny, because he met who he changed Houdini's tire. Yeah. Like, so he didn't yeah. plan out to go be this huge showman. <laughs> yeah. You know, my family, I know all this stuff. This is just my family. So when I was a kid and you're in the backyard having a barbecue and my uncles were bending stuff, I thought that was normal until like nine or 10, you know, good old times. <laughs> and they're playing Frisbee and like, you don't, you don't smash bricks with your hands here, you know, but the one story I didn't know was the Houdini story, which was fascinating when I, when I made the film that no one ever told me this, that so how he became, in the business, uh, really it was vaudeville back then, was he owned a gas station in Galveston, Texas. Uh, a lot of Jews came from Europe into Galveston specifically because that was a, uh, a port that a lot of boats would dock. So that's where he ended up staying. And car comes through saying we have a flat tire. And one of the things that my grandfather would do as a strength act was he would pick up a car and change a tire with his hands with no tools um, and grip which is something we should focus on. Grip is the real thing you have to train to do these things. 
most people in this area of their hand are just weak. We all have this fleshy part right here. I was a kid when he passed, but the two things that I remember about him were the dent in his forehead and the fact that he could flex this and make a muscle like a bicep. Wow. When he grabbed something, he got it. There was no undoing that. And so he would take the lug nuts of a tire and just change them with his hands. So the car was about a mile away from where the gas station was. And so he just walked back with a tire and the, something called the cold patch and he didn't bring any tools and the guy didn't know why he didn't bring any tools. So he had no idea who was in the car. Uh, and it was Houdini, Houdini's manager, and then two people traveling with them, picks up the car, takes the tire off and Houdini's manager, his manager, his name was Petrov, looks down like what on earth is happening right now. And so after he changes the tire with everyone still in the car, um, he just said, who are you and what do you do? And so he took him back to the garage where he had his training facility and said, let me show you some things. And immediately he said, I wanna sign you, come to Brooklyn. And so he moved to New York and the, the family moved about, I think six, seven months later. That, yes, see, it's almost as if the universe was moving for him to, to be who he was supposed to be. You know, I, it's interesting. I, I, for me, I think, you know, luck comes from hard work. And I, you know, he was just, he created his own destiny. He would mm -hmm. not stop it. If, if that person didn't see him, someone else would have seen him. What he did was extraordinary and he wanted to show everyone that he could do it. And I so I, I think it's just a matter of time. There's no way he would have been stuck in that gas station forever. So, so you did answer one of the questions I was going to ask. You did get to, you knew your grandfather, you got to meet him. Briefly. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you're a young child, how many memories do you really have? I, I see him in film. Uh, we have a lot of film of him and my family uh, to my uncle and my father would do photography on the weekends. And so there was always an eight millimeter, you know, film rolling. And so I've seen a lot and I remember through that, but his influence is all over my family. I mean, his influence is, is still felt and it's, you know, he's, he was gone in 1977. So, um, you know, it's, it's been a while, but you know, I don't think someone like that doesn't leave a mark. And then that's something I know he wanted to, he wanted to let people know long after he was gone, I'm sure he would have loved the fact that the film was made just what's possible in your life. What for your life, for, for who you are today, what do you think are the biggest lessons that you've learned from your grandfather? Oh man. Well, first of all, I should eat a lot better. than I do. Um, you know, health and wellness is earned. And, you know, you have to be vigilant. That, that's a big one. And, and really, he wanted people to be healthy more than the strength, more than anything else. He wanted people to be healthy and live clean lives because um, he believed that makes you happy. And aside from having longevity, it, it did, I think, bring happiness to people's lives. Um, but the other thing is what I do, I own a television production company. I've owned my own company now for 20 years. And there's been a million times I've had doors shut in my face. And I do think about, what would he do? I do think about, you know, this is not really a challenge compared to being faced with your own death. And just the mindset of I will achieve has really helped me. And, you know, it's been 20 years. Uh, actually, the reason why I uh, came back this morning on a plane is I'm shooting some AT&T commercials next week. You know, I was a kid in my house dreaming of doing this and now I'm doing it. And it's because of that type of mindset. So if you're listening, the take home lesson today is I will achieve. And that's powerful. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, he's just one example of many that if you look towards that, everything's in how you look at it. You know, it's, it's half full or it's half empty. And he was always a half full type guy. Awesome. Steven, if somebody wants to watch the Mighty Adam documentary, where, where can they go? So it's on Curiosity Stream. Uh, if you subscribe to that, it's also on Amazon and iTunes and Google Play. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your time with me this morning. This has been great. All right. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great weekend.